Last weekend I had an exchange of tweets with a guy who stars himself the Lord Maynard Keynes about the foolishness of the United States imagining that it was in a fit condition to challenge China. I'm just going to elaborate on the reasons why I think that's the case. And it's all been prompted by the rise of the ASUS AUKUS Pact, which uh, took place last week. Now, what is this pact? It's a pact involving Australia, the UK and the US. And it's a naval defence treaty announced the 15th of September, which is due to be signed this week at the UN when the leaders of the countries are attending the UN. The Downing Street announcement said that the AUKUS partnership will work to protect our people and support a peaceful and rules-based international order. The first initiative will be collaboration on future nuclear-powered submarines for the Royal Australian Navy. The agreement appears to involve the construction of eight nuclear submarines in Australia. They are likely to be either the British Astute class shown here or perhaps the US Virginia class submarines. These are nuclear powered submarines and British and US but not French submarine reactors involve the use of highly enriched uranium fuel. This gives them 30 years or so without refuelling. But highly enriched uranium is a potential nuclear prol proliferation issue, since fuel could in principle be used for bomb making. And China has flagged the proliferation risk involved in this. Now if you're going to power ships with enriched uranium, you need some way of obtaining enriched uranium. Australia has no nuclear industry. It has no nuclear power stations and no enrichment plants. So they would depend on UK or US supplied fuel unless they decided to embark on their own nuclear enrichment industry. In which case Australia would be within easy reach of weapons production. It's said that the construction will be at uh, the naval shipyard in Adelaide. It's unlikely that any ships would be completed until the 2030s. Uh, a fleet of eight nuclear submarines would actually give them more nuclear submarines than either Britain or France and would make them the third largest nuclear submarine navy. Now the question is why? It's 70 years since Britain became a nuclear power carrying out its first atomic tests off the Australian coast and although it's been said that a number of previous Australian governments wanted access to nuclear technology, it's only now that Britain is selling the technology to, to Australia. Why? Well, what they say in the announcement, I'm delighted to join President Biden and Prime Minister Morrison to announce that the UK Australia and the United Kingdom are creating a new trilateral defence partnership known as AUKUS with the aim of working hand in glove to preserve security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. That's the declared aim of setting up this treaty. What this means is that it's directed at China. It's not directed at Indonesia, although Indonesia is in some way a more plausible adversary to Australia. 
What's the target of it, the submarines? Are they to stop the Chinese invading Australia? That's very unlikely. It's more probable they're part of joining a US-led preparation for a naval blockade of China in the event of conflict over Taiwan. The obvious area of operations of the, the submarines would be at the choke points linking Chinese trade to Europe, the Middle East and Africa. But this assumes an actual war involving AUKUS against China, perhaps started by a conflict over Taiwan. And what would be the risks of such a war? The Australian submarines won't be built until the 2030s, but the crisis may well come very much sooner than that. You've got to look at what the Australian politicians and the Australian press are saying over the last few months. Back in April, we had the Home Affairs Secretary saying, in a world of per perpetual tension and dread, the drums of war beat, sometimes faintly and distantly, and at other times more loudly and ever closer, which is about as threatening a statement as you can get from a, a, a leading minister and a government. Then look at what the Chinese press was saying on the 13th of September. The China Global Times, which is often taken as a newspaper which expresses views close to the Chinese government, says there will be a long sequence of escalations in the Cross Straits game between the Chinese mainland and the US and the island of Taiwan. But the flyover of a mainland fighter jet will be the most critical step. Let us be fully prepared that there will be a showdown in the Taiwan Straits. Let us send our first PLA fighter jet over the island of Taiwan at the most accurate time. That would be a milestone on China's path to reunification. Note that it's not saying it might happen, it's saying it will happen. And if you read the full report, they make it clear that these are things which the PLA is training for. Theresa May, the former British Prime Minister, said in Parliament on hearing of the AUKUS Pact, my right honourable friend yes, said yesterday, that this partnership has the aim of working hand in glove to preserve security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. What are the implications of this pact for the stance and response of the United Kingdom would take should China attempt to invade Taiwan? It was notable that the Prime Minister Boris Johnson did not repudiate this possibility. So, we have it clearly set out what the trigger would be. The Chinese press are saying it. China will send fighter jets over Taiwan. Since China and the UN officially recognise Taiwan as Chinese territory, they would on that account be flying within Chinese sovereign airspace. And the Chinese believe that both the Taiwanese and the US will back down at that point. Now, is this calculation rational on the part of the Chinese? I believe they're probably right, since the US would certainly lose a war with China now. I'm going to look at the likely course of this, and I'm assuming that since both China and the USA are heavily armed nuclear powers that mutually assured destruction would inhibit each of them from possibly using nuclear weapons. And I'll look at what might happen in the first year of a war, what the strategic resources of the countries are, and how the war would end up in the last year. 
the first point is to note that China has developed long-range ballistic anti-ship missiles and the range of these missiles is considerably greater than the range of aircraft flying from US aircraft carriers. The ballistic anti-ship missiles have such high speed that they cannot be intercepted by any defense mechanism the United States Navy has. And this makes the sailing of large US warships close to China very dangerous in the event of hostilities. So it's clear that the PLA will be able to establish sea and air dominance over the Taiwan Straits. They can transport sufficient forces across to eventually subdue the resistance of Taiwan. And US support would be limited to airlifts in the short period prior to Taiwanese air defences and air bases being disabled. Well, everyone knows that China is a big country. Chinese industrial cities are absolutely huge and it would take a very big air force to seriously damage uh, these large cities in a huge country with a very large number of huge cities. And the United States no longer has the large bomber fleets that it used against Korea and Vietnam. The B-52 bombers are more than 60 years old and couldn't remain safely over Chinese airspace to engage in carpet bombing the way they did over Vietnam or the way the B-29s did over Korea. America also has very few of them. In 2019 there were only 58 B-52s left out of the 744 that were originally built. There were 20 of the 25-year-old B-2s, which is their most modern plane, and 62 of their 45-year-old B-1s. So they have a relatively small force of old bombers. 140 max in service now, which is actually smaller than the Royal Air Force V-bomber force used to be in the 1960s. So it gives an impression of the degree of decline of American power. It's declined to the extent that British imperial power had declined by the 1960s. Since they can't directly bomb overhead, their plan is to use standoff missiles and they have relatively small stocks of these. They have 2,000 air-launched missiles and 2,500 in the Navy. By comparison, in the second Gulf War against Iraq, a much smaller country, 800 were used up. Attacking China, this stock of missiles would be used up within a day or two. And the number of targets it could hit is tiny compared to the scale of Chinese industry. So any war between AUKUS and China is likely to be a naval blockade aiming at blocking Chinese trade through the Indian Ocean and across the Pacific. But since America, Europe and the Middle East are all heavily dependent on Chinese imports, this would be more harmful to the rest of the world than it would be to China. Now let's look at shipbuilding capacity. In any long naval war, it's shipbuilding capacity that determines who wins. Britain was able to maintain naval dominance over Germany in 1914 to 18 because it could outbuild the German Navy. The US, despite, despite being defeated by the Japanese in 1940, 41, 41, 42, 
was able to massively outbuild the Japanese Navy so that by 445 it was able to win. So industrial capacity counts. At the moment, East Asia dominates world shipbuilding. The primary world shipbuilding country is China, followed by Korea and then Japan. Europe and the rest of the world make up a very small proportion of that. So US shipbuilding capacity is tiny compared to that of China. And in the event of a war between the US and China, South Korea is either going to remain neutral, or if it doesn't remain neutral, it would be quickly invaded by North Korea and China, at which point the Korean shipbuilding industry would not be available to the US and its allies. The US would only have one large shipbuilding industry in a country potentially friendly to it, which is Japan. And the Japanese industry, as you can see, is much smaller than the Chinese and Korean industries. This is recognized by top US commanders. The head of the US Marine Corps was reported as saying replacing ships in combat will be problematic inasmuch as our industrial base has shrunk while peer adversaries have expanded their shipbuilding capacity. In an extended conflict, the United States will be on the losing end of a production race, reversing the advantage we had in World War II when we last fought a peer competitor. The end result would be that after three or more years of war, the US alliance would see their naval dominance ceded to China, their economies would be in tatters, the political prestige of Western capitalism would have sunk, and the future stability and unity of the United Kingdom and the US themselves would become doubtful.